that's a different world down oh, south, oh, south yeah. Louisiana under under I ten. Plaquemines oh. Parish is not in the United States. Don't let anybody tell you this. We were at uh, we were under their own rule. We were on a uh, on a float at not New Orleans, but you know further back this sure. year. And uh, I was <laughs> yeah, I was throwing beads and stuff. Yeah. I threw it to his kid, and the kid looked red, wrapped around his neck, hit him in the face. I said, ooh. Mama looked at me, looked at the kid. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you, hey, that's an uh, occupational hazard. You stand there, you, if you're standing there to catch bees, you better be able to catch bees, man. Don't be, don't be standing there if you can't catch them. Because they co they're coming. Well, well, I think my wife showed up, but she sat down. Mine's, hey, mine's back there running. Larry. The, running the one. Uh, hey, Larry. Push the right button. Well, good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started in just a second. I'm going to shut this door. Again. Good morning. 
And welcome to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. It is absolutely gorgeous outside. Um, I am glad that you are here worshiping with us in person or that you are worshiping online uh, with us. My name is Jacob Hunter and I'm the pastor here at Industry United Methodist Church. And I hope that this is a meaningful uh, time for you uh, and the Lord. Will you join me in an attitude of prayer for our opening prayers we begin worship? Lord, open our hearts to the surprising ways in which you offer to us your love and your presence. Help us to truly believe in the wondrous ways that you work in our lives. Give us hearts and spirits for service to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us as you're able? Oh, 
Thank you, guys. You may be seated. We already did the opening prayer. There we go. <laughs> that was okay. Awesome. Um, will you join me in an attitude of prayer for the prayer for illumination as we prepare to hear God's word spoken and read this morning? Uh, I invite you to take a few moments to center your hearts. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Amen. Our first scripture reading today comes from the Old Testament. It comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 62, verses 1 through 5. Hear now the word of God. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until her vindiction shines out like the dawn, and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations, shall, the nations shall see your vindication, and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name, that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Would you stand with us as you're able?
His mercy reigns on it. Amen, amen. I invite you to remain standing uh, for our gospel reading this morning. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Once again, hear the word of God. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be to God. You may be seated, except for the young ones. I invite the young folks forward. Uh, well, good morning, guys. How are y'all today? Cool. So, you know, we, I usually try to tie my socks into the church service and stuff, and today I just felt like wearing socks that really didn't go with the service. So I thought I'd show them to you, though. It's the cat in the hat. Isn't that cool? That's one of my favorite stories. So the story that I just read, what was that story about? <laughs> yes, it was about Jesus. Uh, what did Jesus do in the story? He did make wine, right? They ran out of wine at this wedding. They were at a wedding. How many of y'all have been to a wedding before? (laughs) So when you go to a wedding, it's a big party, right? It's a big party and it's exciting and everything's going on. And it seems like the people that were throwing this wedding forgot to do something. They forgot to bring enough wine for everybody. Now, Jesus is there with his disciples. He's just a guest. He's just invited. He just is there hanging out, enjoying himself, probably doing the chicken dance, you know, doing all the things you do at a wedding. <laughs> and all of a sudden, they run out of wine, and his mom comes up to him and says, Hey, um, Jesus, uh, they, they ran out of wine. And Jesus is like, Yeah, and? It's not my wedding. It's someone else's responsibility. And she basically tells him, Fix this problem. And he does. And, they, and he gets the water in these jugs and he changes them into wine. And it, the, the important part of this story, there's so many important parts of the story, but one of the most important parts of the story is at the very end of the passage, the story, you know what it says? It says, and his disciples believed in him. Because you see, at this point, he had just had the disciples with him. They, they were there. He had called them. They hadn't really done anything. This is the first thing he does as Jesus. He makes this miraculous thing happen. Do you think it's easy to change water into wine? No, probably not. 
I mean, I've never tried, but I don't think I'd be successful. And so Jesus does this miraculous thing. And then the disciples know that he truly is someone special, this guy that they've chosen to follow. And, it set, and, they, and then they all set off. And the next few years are this amazing story of how Jesus helps people and the disciples go along with Jesus and help people as well. But this is the very beginning. This is one of the first things he does. And it's important that we remember that because this is where the disciples see for the first time this guy truly is the Son of God. Because to be able to do that, you've got to be someone special, right? Or some kind of magician. And I don't think even a magician could do that. So this is the very beginning. We're getting ready to start telling stories for the next few weeks, the next couple of months. We're going to be telling all these stories of Jesus' ministry as we lead up to Easter. And so this is it. This is how it starts. And the disciples believed in him. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for sending this gift of your son and the miraculous things he did and the people he helped. Help us to remember all of the stories that follow this important one. I, invite, I ask you to be with these young people and their families as we all go out into the world. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, thanks, guys. So, this is a story that we know because it is one of the miracles that Jesus does. But it's one that we just kind of say, oh, it's when he turned water to wine. You know, that's what he did. That's what happened. And, and there's a whole lot that goes into this story that we really don't focus on quite often. Um, I do want to say one thing up front. If you feel like you need to get a fix of wine from Cana of Galilee, if you go to Cana in Galilee, there's like three different places that sell Canaan, or Canaan of Galilee wedding wine. You can find it everywhere over there. Just so you know, if you need some. It's not the same wine that Jesus turned from the water, though. I'm sorry. But Jesus, Jesus hasn't started his ministry yet. Jesus has just got with the disciples. He's just got the disciples to follow him. And they're probably just getting to know one another. And think about the commitment that it takes, first of all, for these disciples to just drop everything and follow this guy who came out of nowhere. This guy who just showed up and was like, hey guys, let's go for a three-year walk and we're going to go preach and heal some people. Let's do that. And they're like, okay, we'll leave everything behind Jesus. No big deal. So they're just getting to know one another. They're just getting to know each other. And they get invited to a wedding in Cana. And so they go. They all go to the wedding in Cana. And at this wedding is Jesus' mother. Now you notice... It never tells us her name, right? It just calls her his mother. But we know it's Mary. And so Mary and Jesus and the disciples are there. And like I said to the kids, probably having a good time. The wedding has probably happened. They're, they're having dinner afterwards. And now, something you need to know about weddings in that day and time in that place. Um, it, you know how you go to a wedding now and you go to the church service and you sit there for about an hour if, you're, if the preacher doesn't go on? And then you all get in the car if you're going somewhere else and you go to the reception site and then you're there at the reception and it's, you know, a couple of hours. And then at the very end, usually, as, you're, as the bride and groom are leaving, you throw bird seed or rice or some of them I've seen use bubbles, you know, as they're leaving to go off and to start their new life. And how, what a great, exciting thing it is. And it encapsulates just a few hours on a Saturday or Sunday and that's how weddings are now. Weddings in this day and time were a commitment. You started out with a party, then you had, then you all went from that place over to the synagogue or wherever the wedding was going to take place, and then you came back and you had dinner, and then there was another party. It was a couple day ordeal when the wedding happened. It wasn't just one short day, one few, a couple of hours. It was a commitment. You had to really want to be there. And Jesus and his disciples were there, and with his mom also being there. 
And so in that day and time, like the scripture says, usually what they did is they gave the good wine first. They usually got all the good wine they could get. The good wine. And when I say good wine, what do you think I mean by good wine? Quality. Quality but, but something else here. It, it says here... Um, uh, what did it, uh, you gave the first, so uh, inferior wine after the guests had become drunk. So when I say good wine, quality and tasty, tasty and quality wine, the good stuff, the stuff that's going to get people to not really think about uh, what's going on and not realize that afterwards the Boone's Farm comes out. <laughs> that's not a knock on Boone's Farm. Boone's Farm, if you're watching... It's just reality. It's not the Dom Perignon, uh, you know. But that's what they would do back in that day. They would give the good wine first so you would not really think about the rest of the wine you're going to be drinking the rest of the night. They would get to where you would be having a good time probably doing the chicken dance or the equivalent in Judeans, uh, first century Judea. They were all having a good time. And they were drinking wine and they were eating and they were just having a good time. And all of a sudden... Mary, Jesus' mother, finds out they're out of wine. Now, they're not just out of the good wine. They're out of wine. Y'all ever been at a party where something runs out? I'm not talking, even if it's not alcohol. You ever been at a party? I was at a party once. It was a pizza party, and we ran out of pizza. <laughs> it's a hard sell to get people to stay at a pizza party if you don't have pizza. It's the same things going on here. They're out of wine. Now, now I don't want you to think, the other thing we need to talk about real quick when we talk about wine is that they're not a bunch of alcoholics who are all going to just drink wine for fun and get drunk. They are there to drink wine and because, partly because um, in that time, you didn't really want to drink the water. <laughs> the, the wine had you know, gone through a process and it was safer, wine was safer to drink than water. And so that's why they're drinking wine and they're having a good time and they run out of wine. And if, like I said, if you've ever been at a party where you run out of something, it turns south quickly, quickly. And so Mary comes over to Jesus and says, Jesus, they've run out of wine. And I love his response because this isn't the Jesus we get in lots of other places, right? The, the other gospels, we get this very compassionate Jesus who wants to take care of people and make sure everything is okay and make sure that things are going well. And Jesus' response is, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? <laughs> and Jesus is like, I don't care. I'm not buying them wine. <laughs> this is their response. They invited me. They should have the wine. Mary is concerned. Now, she could be concerned for lots of reasons. Um, it's believed, and some people believe that it might be a family member if Mary and Jesus are both there. Because you didn't just, often you didn't get invited to random strangers' weddings. And so if it is a family member, it does kind of become his problem. But still, not really. Mary might also be concerned because of what I just said a minute ago. Water wasn't safe to drink. And so if they're out of wine and all they have is water, Mary might be concerned that she or other people are going to get sick. And so for whatever reason she is concerned, she goes to Jesus and she's like, Jesus, we're out of water. Now, why does she go to Jesus? Or they're out of wine. Jesus, why does she go to Jesus? I mean, up until this point, who is Jesus? He's the kid who stayed at the temple at 12 years old. That's all that he had really done at this point, right? Stayed at the temple at Passover, and then when his parents came to get him, they get after him, and he's like, don't you know I'm going to be in my father's house? This is, that's what we know of Jesus' life up until this point. She, uh, Mary goes to Jesus because she knows. I did really good not saying anything around Christmas time, but I'm going to say it now. There's this song at Christmas that we sing quite often, and, and the only version I really like is the Kenny Rogers version because my mom loved it, and it's just a good memory for me. But there's this song called Mary, Did You Know? Did, he, did she know? Yeah, she knew. Mary knew. 
The arguments that can be made, we also see it here, right? Mary knew Jesus could do something about this. Mary knew that Jesus had the power to change the situation that they were in where they were out of wine. And it's not like you could run to the corner liquor store or you could run to the HEB or go to Lindemann's right on the corner and find a bottle of wine. It took, it was an endeavor to get wine back then. And you probably couldn't buy it in a lot of places. You had to make your own. And so she knows that this is a situation that only Jesus can solve. So she asks Jesus. And he says, you know, this isn't our concern, Mom. Let's, let's not get involved here. And she's, she, what does she say to Jesus after that? Does she say anything to Jesus after that? That's right. She turns without saying anything to him to the stewards who are serving, the waiters that are there, and turns to them and says, do whatever he says, and then she walks away. You know that saying, you've been voluntold to do something? Jesus was voluntold by his mom to t- fix this problem. So there are these big jars that hold 30 gallons of water. And they're for the ritual purification. Um, If you were here last week for the Dead Sea Scrolls, or if you've ever heard me talk about ritual purification and baptism, I've talked about mikvahs, these things that you would go into and you would immerse yourself and then you'd come out the other side and you were clean. And it's what you had to do to go into the temple or to a religious place, or just in general, every so often you had to ritually purify yourself. And so that's what these jars are for, their designation in life. Their whole purpose is to hold the water, to take from wherever they're getting the water to these mikvahs, probably, dumping them in as pure holy water. And so they're full of water. And Jesus says to them, take some of that water out. You notice he's not like a magician, right? You know, when you go to see David Copperfield or David Blaine or any of those guys that do magic, they always have something they've got to say, right? They've got to tell you what's going on, and then they've got to say the magic words, and then they've got to throw a thing up in the air and all things disappear and then there's smoke and you notice Jesus just says hey take the water out of the jug and they do and they drink it and they're like oh my gosh look at this wine this is the best wine I've ever had this wine is awesome and so they what they do next is they take it to the steward the chief steward the one in charge the head waiter and they're like drink this check this out And so that guy goes to the bridegroom and he scolds him. He scolds him and he says, hey, what are you doing? Why did you wait forever to put this good wine out? Why have we been drinking this other wine that is not really good? And now we've got this really good wine. And he says, normally we give the good wine first so people don't know when the bad wine comes out. And we're doing it backwards here. Can you imagine being the bridegroom? The bridegroom knows, right? When you plan a party, when you plan something, you know exactly how much stuff you have. And as more and more cars pull up, you're like, oh, Lord. Um, Then you start thinking, Jesus, can we do the bread and fish thing, you know, because I'm I'm not going to have enough queso here for everybody. (laughs) You've all been there before, haven't you? The bridegroom knew, or at least the parents of the bridegroom knew. The people throwing the party knew that they didn't have enough wine. They were already using the good wine. And, you know, they, 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 and to them, it wasn't really good, though. But it was the best they had. And so this wedding's happening, and they're probably like, oh, dear God, please let this wine last. And somebody, the chief steward comes up and says, man, why did you hold the good wine? The bridegroom must have been like, I don't know what you were talking about. This is the first thing Jesus does in his ministry in the book of John. This is the first time that people realize who Jesus is. And so we talk about this, wet, this miracle at the wedding in Cana. And it is a miracle. I'm not going to lie to you. Anyone that can turn water into wine and it be legit and not something fake, that's a miracle. It's an amazing thing. And so this happens. And and when we talk about it, though, we talk about this is the turning point in Jesus' ministry. And we talk about it like this is like the moment. And it is the moment. It really is the moment for Jesus' ministry where it takes a corner. But guess what? The other people don't know what's going on. 
The other people don't know why this, this wine has appeared. It wasn't done. It's not like David Copperfield. Jesus didn't stand up. Like I said, he didn't have a, uh, you know, a curtain and you know, there wasn't a beautiful woman standing there going... None of that was happening. Jesus didn't even say anything other than take some water out of that jug. This is an important turning point in the ministry of Jesus. But for only a few people. For only a few people. You see, these people have committed their lives to this guy, Jesus. This guy, Jesus, shows up, and he's preaching, and they, he invites them to come with him, and they have given up everything now at this point, and they're getting ready to head out with Jesus, and this is one of the first stops they make. And you, you know when you get that moment where you're like, oh my gosh, did I make the right choice? Did I make the right choice? You know, buyer's remorse. You know, oh man, maybe I shouldn't have bought that Flo B. Y'all know what Flo B is? I don't know how I got into this the other night, but anyway, so anyway, it has nothing to do with this except if you bought one, if you know what it is you bought when you made a mistake. It's a thing you put on your vacuum cleaner and it sucks your hair up into it and it cuts your hair. If you bought one, you made a mistake. And so these disciples might have been thinking at this point, man, we've given up everything and now we're going to a wedding. They, we didn't say anything about weddings. And so they're at this wedding and this amazing thing happens. And then the turning point isn't for the people at the wedding. The turning point isn't for all of the guests there or the stewards who are watching or anything. The turning point says this, and his disciples believed in him. And his disciples believed in him. I'll tell you what. We wouldn't be here this many years later still telling the story if the disciples didn't believe in Jesus. If they didn't believe in the things he could do, the miracles that were possible with him. Our faith is based on their faith because they were the ones firsthand to see it. And it was this simple act that started it all. The simple act where Jesus, he's, he's not even on duty really. He and the disciples and his mom are hanging out at a wedding, having a good time, eating dinner. And Jesus is probably thinking, man, I don't know how I'm going to make my entrance into this whole Jesus thing. I don't know how I'm going to start. It's kind of like pastors when they're trying to write a sermon and you've got an idea for the conclusion, you know what you want to say at the very end and you have no clue what you want to say at the beginning and you don't know how to start it, Jesus probably is thinking, how do I get this thing kicked off? He's not yet Jesus, he's Jesus of Nazareth. But his mom had faith in him. His mom knew what he was capable of. His mother knew. Mary knew. Mary knew what Jesus could do. And Mary knew that it was time for Jesus to start doing. And so like any good mama bird, she shoves him out of the nest. <laughs> he starts flapping his wings. And he doesn't come down. He goes on for a few years with these disciples who now witness this thing and now believe in him as well. And the next few years of his ministry are amazing. They're life-changing. They're life-changing for the people that were there. They're life-changing for Lazarus. They're life-changing for everyone involved. Especially the disciples. But it was this one simple act, this one thing that got it all started. There's so much we can take from this. There's so much we can take from this. But I want the kids to listen to one of the most important things you can take from this, okay? Do what your mom says. Do what your mom says. Because she 
was the catalyst for this amazing story that we are still telling 2,000 plus years later. It just took this one act for people to, fo to follow, to believe in, to have faith in Jesus and what was about to happen. And after this, the world was changed forever for the better. Let us remember this story. When we struggle, when we struggle with why do we do this? Or when we struggle with did this stuff really happen? We have this story that helps us remember everything else that came after. Amen. Um, <clears throat> I invite you to stand as you're able, and we are going to uh, read the Apostles' Creed. We're going to say the Apostles' Creed. Um, we're going to do this because I believe it's important that we do say and remember why it is we believe what we believe. Will you join me, please? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We come to that time in our worship where we come together as the body of Christ, and together we share with one another the joys and concerns that are on our hearts and minds, and then with one voice we lift those joys and concerns up to God. I'll share with you a couple of joys and a couple of concerns uh, this morning. Uh, we start this morning, as we do, we lift up all of those who are ill, those who are sick. We lift them up and we pray for them. We lift up those who are in treatment for various things, and we lift up those uh, especially who have COVID. We uh, pray for them and lift them up and uh, pray that they uh, get through that okay. And we lift up all of the doctors and nurses everywhere who are doing everything they can to help all the people that they do. I also lift up this morning our leaders around the world, and I pray, my, my prayer is, and I hope that your prayer is as well, that every leader around the world, as they seek to make decisions, they do so with the guidance of God, and that as they make these decisions, that they do so for the betterment of everyone and not just a few or for personal gain. Another thing I would like to lift up this morning is, I don't know if you saw yesterday or not, but in Colleyville, Texas, during worship service at a synagogue in the morning, uh, a guy went in and held uh, several people hostage. Four people were held hostage, including a rabbi. It didn't conclude, the standoff didn't conclude until last night. Um, everyone made it out, well, all the hostages made it out okay. Um, the other person uh, that perpetrated this did not. Um, so I lift up. Uh, prayers for um, for those four people who were held hostage, including the rabbi, for their families and for their synagogue, as it's something that they went through that is a horrible, horrible thing. And no one should have to go through something like that, especially at a place of worship. I lift them up and continue to pray for them. Uh, a couple of prayers that have been given to me. One from Andy. Oh, here we go. The fear Prayers for the fear mute. Is that right? Fear mute family? Fire mute. Um, you know, God knows, and uh, we lift up that family. Um, it's a close friend and a teammate of Andy's whose dad suddenly passed away on Tuesday. So we definitely lift them up and pray for their family as they go through this time. 
Uh, Rick is not in here, and he's given me this card, and I'm always hesitant to lift this up in prayer, but I'm going to because, oh, there's Rick. Rick, I'm always hesitant, man. The last time I did this, we got like 19 inches. <laughs> Rick has lifted up a prayer for rain, and so I will lift that prayer up, but just remember, if we get another 19 inches and ponds overflow, it was Rick that brought this prayer up. <laughs> I lift that up. No, we, we do need rain. And so, and we're not the only ones. So we lift up uh, prayers for that. Absolutely. Uh, a couple of uh, joys I'd like to lift up. One of them is the wonderful potluck last week. Thank you for everyone who helped make that possible. Uh, it was a wonderful time. I said it earlier in the year, uh, or maybe at the end of last year, that my goal this year is to do more of that to do more of gathering together as the entire body of the church and have fellowship, not just in worship, but have fellowship over meals and other things. And so it was such a great time to get together and welcome our new members as well. And so it was a wonderful time. And thank you for everyone who helped make that possible. And then a final joy that I'll lift up is one from Elena. Elena lifts up a joy that her 4-H Junior Livestock Quiz Bowl team won first place at, their, at her very first meet uh, yesterday, um, earlier this week, Friday. So they're her first time competing. Their team won first place in the, the 4-H quiz uh, team won. And so that's awesome. That's really exciting. So congratulations on that. That's awesome. That's one of those things that I would probably drag that team way down. And I'd be like, that's a pig. <laughs> and that's where my identification ends, pig. If there are no others, let us go to God in prayer. Lord of light and joy, the daylight hours are becoming longer for us. Evening comes a little later and the dawn is earlier, but the darkness in our hearts and minds sometimes persists. We continue to look at the miraculous ways you work in our lives as mere stories or happenstance. Lord, how foolish we are. From the beginning of all, of that, all that is, you have poured your love and light into this world and into our lives. You have offered us countless blessings and opportunities for service, some of which we have followed and others we have ignored. You have forgiven and healed our spirits. We continue to bring before you the names and situations of people that are in dire, dire need. We ask for your healing mercies, and yet we wonder if you are really with us. Turn our moaning and crying into songs of praise and hope. Give us spirits of trust and rejoicing that we may truly be your people all of our days. Prepare us for joyful service in your world, for we ask this in Jesus' name, and in his name we pray the prayer that he taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Would you stand with us as you're able? I never think about filling out one of those prayer cards, but I just wanted to let you all know that um, yesterday, how now our, our cow... Had a brown calf. Isn't that handy? <laughs> That's Leslie's cow. How now? Just thought I'd let y'all know that. <laughs> Praise the Lord, oh, when those gates open wide, I'm going to sit by 
by Jesus' side. Say, I'm gonna shout, praise the Lord. Sweet Lord, sweet carry on. Come and pour the carry me home. Sweet Lord, sweet carry on. Come and pour the carry me home. I'm gonna sing, 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 sing. I'm gonna shout, 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 shout. I'm gonna sing and shout. Praise the Lord. Oh, when those gates open wide, I'll sing by Jesus' side. I'm gonna shout, praise the Lord. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Go marching in. Jesus, I sing, I'm gonna shout, praise the Lord. This train is bound for glory, this train. This train is bound for glory, this train. This train is bound for glory. Don't ride nothing but the right and the holy. This train is bound for glory. My favorite part of that song is when the air brakes stop the train at the end of the song. I love that part. That's my favorite part. As we prepare to go out into the world this day, I've got a couple of announcements for you. The first one, actually, I'd like to invite Terry forward. She has an announcement she'd like to make. Well, this is a little bit, are we on? It's on. Is it? Okay. This is a little bit late in coming, uh, but we, as the church congregation, appreciate so much that Lori and Alicia do with the kiddos and and so we want to recognize y'all just with a little gift of appreciation not just for for the Christmas program that we all love so much but you guys do so much and any time that the kids are involved in the service we just appreciate your service and you've done it for years and we just hope you keep on doing it so we just have a little gift for you from the church as appreciation y'all come forward <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, y'all. If y'all if y'all didn't see, or if you weren't here or didn't see the children's program, go back and look it up online. It's really awesome. They did an amazing job. Uh, and so uh, thank y'all for all that you do for the kids of this church. We really are truly grateful. Thank you. Andy? The Big Red Rainbow Band is hosting their annual chicken spaghetti dinner, and I have tickets. Um, it'll start with the sixth grade concert at 2. It's off. And case of the sixth grade concert at two um, in the pavilion and off the square in Belleville and then uh, February 5th. Saturday, February 5th. Um, and then it'll be followed from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. Um, pick up for the chicken spaghetti at Concordia Hall. The tickets are $10 a piece and some of that will go into my account to help pay for trips. I'm looking forward to it. I love chicken spaghetti, so it sounds good. We missed it last year. Uh, we were out of town the day it happened, so uh, we are looking forward to it this year. Um, the final announcement I have is I have a slide for it. If you weren't here last week, or if you were here last week, uh, this, uh, today will be the conclusion of our Dead Sea Scrolls uh, presentation that I'll be doing during the Sunday school hour. I invite you to stay for that if you would like. Um, and uh, if you missed last week's, um, it's online. You can watch it. Um, and so we'll also be streaming today as well. Uh, and it'll be online later. So those are the announcements we have. The final announcement I have is please don't come here next Sunday morning. If you do, you're going to find a locked building. 
Next Sunday is the chicken fry. We need everyone's help that we can get. So if you don't know your responsibility, Alicia can talk, can help you out. I can help you out. Uh, somebody can get you the information. Marianne or Elaine, there's lots of ways to find out. But we will not be having worship next Sunday morning. Uh, we'll be over at the Fireman's Hall. So I invite you all to come and uh, take part in that uh, as this annual tradition continues. As you go out into this world, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace always and forever. Amen. This train is bound for glory. This train is bound for glory. Don't ride nothing but the rocks and the hole. This train is bound for glory. This train is bound for glory.